fun to be here. I've not been in this northeastern building. I live uh, a mere two miles from here in Brookline and crossed it on the way to uh, many places, including my husband works at Boston Medical Center, so it's hard to cut through, let alone my own old boss, Michael Dukakis, who still calls me once a month and says, I've got the best intern for you. Northeastern is the only place you can accept interns from. I'm sending the student over. You do have a job for them, right, Mizzy? Uh, so uh, I like the back and forth with Northeastern, whether I'm driving by being regaled about the best students in the world, and our interns have only confirmed that. It's not only in my former boss's opinion, Michael Dukakis, uh, but this is a great institution. So for friends who are part of the community or for students, uh, it really is fun and a privilege for me to be here. Uh, and for all of you who came out on what's a pretty cold night, uh, thank you. I appreciate your taking the time. I'm going to talk for one or two more minutes about myself and, and, and not to embellish or talk about accolades. Uh, one or two minutes about series and then launch into why I think now may be a moment in time, and one can only hope we've got some big battles to take on what I think is the greatest existential threat challenging us. The, problem of climate change, and certainly I'll talk more about it, but I also want to talk about how to address it and what some of the solutions are, not only the extraordinary depth and breadth of the problem, but I want to talk about why it's not only one of the greatest environmental, public health, national security, personal threats to literally our children's future, and frankly to part of our day-to-day -day existence today, but why it's one of the greatest economic threats lingering out there, and the fiscal cliff, quite honestly, is small compared to the climate cliff. That the subprime meltdown implications could be exaggerated in double or triple if we really look at the implications of climate change. And I believe the discussion that we should have going forward as a community, not just me, but all of us, is why we need to act yesterday or now or immediately, and I was delighted, I must say, uh, by the President's speech two days ago where he talked about climate as one of the three priorities is something we need to address now and we need to think about how we're addressing it. The way to move the dial, I think, and the debate and the steps to address it, I believe will be driven by the economy, driven by capital markets and integrating sustainability into capital markets rather than talking about these issues as environmental tree hugger issues or externalities, or these are on balance sheet risks, not off balance sheet risks. And if the economy is what drives decisions, the economic arguments are plentiful. They're deep, they're thorough, they run through every industry sector, they run across every economy of every country, and we need to talk about it in that frame if that's what will move the United States Congress. And I think we're poised to do that. Back to what I said I was gonna talk about in the order, uh, about myself, that really the only thing I want to say is I've spent the last 35 years thinking about how to address environmental problems at MassPerg and running MassPerg and as a regional administrator in the financial sector, um, at Green Century as a lawyer. And when I left this regional administrator of the EPA and I left when President Clinton left, I was in a political appointee position as regional administrators are. Um, I, I took time, probably the only time of my life, because you know I kept going from job to job and degree to degree and never stopped to think like most of us, and it all sort of worked okay. I, I stopped to think how can I have the best impact for me. I, I think all tactics and strategies are fair and important. And when I was a young lawyer, I used to torture myself, should I be an organizer, an educator, a litigator, an academic? Um, and, and the answer is, we need to have all of those things to solve big, fat problems like climate change. But when I had a few minutes to think, or frankly six months and did some other things during that time, I really did reflect on why I thought moving capital markets, working with people like my colleagues at this table, some of whom I've worked with for a decade and have extraordinary respect for, and they are in the capital markets and making extraordinary change, but moving capital markets was a key tactic and strategy for making change on environmental issues. You know, I could go back and be a litigator and sue the polluters, and a lot of my friends are doing that. 
I, I don't think it's black and white, and I don't think it's that simple, and I don't think there are good guys and bad guys. I think we're talking about really complex problems. But I think an extraordinary amount of the footprint of who's causing the carbon, not because they're bad people. Staples is an extraordinary company, frankly, doing extraordinary things on the environment. But because they're big and they've got a lot of bandwidth, they've got issues. They happen to be a company that's addressing them extraordinarily well. But when you've got hundreds of thousands of employees and thousands of stores and a large footprint and trucks and buses and inventory, you can make a huge difference in the goals you set on addressing pollution or carbon emissions. Uh, and if there's a will, like there is with my colleagues who are here today, and they are the exception, but it's not as much the exception. There's more and more support. You can make change. So the, the ability to have an impact, in my judgment, comes out of the private sector. I'm not abandoning all the other things that we're doing. But it's both where there's an impact and where there's resources to make extraordinary change. I was at a General Motors two weeks ago. They have 385,000 people. When we passed fuel economy standards, which I must say General Motors was on board for last year, the greatest thing we've done in the last decade to deal with carbon pollution or climate change, passing a measure that largely says the average car has to go from 27 miles per gallon to 54 over the next decade, um, the auto companies were on board. Uh, when we had their clout and their ability to move through what I think was the most powerful measure of the last decade to deal with climate change, it made a difference. And there are hundreds of examples like that. Now that doesn't mean dealing with the private sector is not extraordinarily complicated. Everything's complicated. But it is a place of power, it is a place of reach, it is a place of depth, and moving capital markets whether it's companies or investors, and I'll talk about that as well, I think is a very big part of the solution. We need to change the conversation from addressing climate as an extreme tree hugger issue to the future of our planet, the future of our children, and frankly, the future of our economy. And we need to change that conversation in the capital markets, because that's where we're going to get clout and pick up and the ability to change. So largely, what I want to say about me is, spent the last 35 years, as I said, trying different things, having spent the last 10 years attempting to move capital markets, it still feels to me like the discussion we ought to be having, the tactics and strategies we ought to be moving. Last week I was in Abu Dhabi for the week. People say, do you have any jet lag? My one talent, and I would boast about nothing else, is I'm an extraordinarily good sleeper. So I just got back from Abu Dhabi, slept on the plane all the way home to back home, <laughs> after a 24-hour trip and slept all night and no jet lag, which is a good thing. But where Ceres won something called the Zayed Future Energy Prize. It was an international contest, 88 countries, 800 applicants, and we won a million and a half dollars because of the tactics and strategies of working with capital market leaders to address climate change. Um, it's oil money, Sheikh Zayed, and a bunch of other sheikhs. Uh, you may see it as sheep, but... Uh, uh, ran this program, it's a $4 million gift to a couple of categories. Um, but internationally, it was pulled out as a model for tactics and strategies. What we do is series, in 1989, our mission was to integrate sustainability into capital markets. And the very cool thing is in 2013, our mission is to integrate sustainability into capital markets. I've been around all sorts of organizations, good and bad, stable, not flaky, who change their mission, often based on the times. The really cool thing about Ceres is, and it was a visionary and certainly not me, who came up with the fact that we need to integrate these issues. Sustainability needs to be as important to Mark Buckley, and I know it is, but to every other company as it is to the not-for-profits or the environmental organizations. Um, and that's the key. Not an off-balance sheet risk, not something to think about in a good year, not something to worry about when you have to because some advocate is bothering you, but sustainability needs to be integrated into the core of our capital markets. And let me talk a little bit, bring that down one level about what I think that means and how at least we approach it. Other people approach it differently, um, but an important set of concepts in my judgment. So what we do day to day to try and sort of bring this down and not give unlimited stories, and, and, and again, 
The magnitude is so big that I think the time is right, more right than it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago, to really integrate sustainability in capital markets. Two years ago, people might really have said, this is going to cost jobs. This is bad for the economy. I mean, let us just look across our marketplace. And of course, we're all overusing, but it's real, and it's an example. Hurricane Sandy will cost us $50 billion in insured losses. Likely, we saw a $50 billion aid project, uh, so $100 billion. We've seen people suffering. We've seen lives changed. We've seen homes ruined. And what used to be a 100-year storm is an every-year storm. We are now seeing those kinds of storms everywhere, not quite in that order of magnitude. We're seeing droughts. We're seeing tsunamis. We're seeing heat waves that are radically changing the way we live, work, and the way businesses are running. In Shanghai, they had to shut down malls last weekend because the hydroelectric power that drives the energy for those malls didn't have enough water to run them, partly a subset and an implication of climate change. We're talking about massive implications. I was out at the Gap um, three weeks ago to talk about their sustainability program. They're a serious company and someone we work with and I have a high regard. They were talking about what the drought in Texas last spring meant. The drought in Texas meant their cotton crop died and it meant a 3% loss in shareholder value because what's the Gap? It's a lot of cotton, a lot of good cotton. Levi Strauss, another company we work with. Um, massive financial implications from the drought and cotton, the agricultural firms that we work with. The Mississippi River is at the lowest point it has ever been in history. Anyone who's in agriculture has faced water shortages over the last two or three years. Not a little bit, but a lot. Massive water shortages that are costing the industry billions of dollars. And when people have less product to shift, it costs truckers and drivers and stores that are expecting the produce and restaurants, and the list goes on and on. It impacts every sector. The insurance industry takes Sandy out in 2011. The property and casualties part of that industry lost $34 billion from increased storms related to climate change. It's not decimal dust. We're not talking about small numbers. We are talking about catastrophic numbers that are only getting larger and bigger and across every sector and across all of our economic uh, breadth and depth. And the other thing about climate change, and let's talk about how we address it and some of the things we're doing, unlike toxic air pollution, I, when I was a regulator or a lawyer, you know, if you were dealing with pollution, you knew the pollution came out of plant X, it impacted community Y, and you wanted to do something about it and you could fight it. I mean, the complex thing about climate change is what happens in Rio de Janeiro impacts Beijing and what happens in New Zealand impacts Boston. It's a collective problem. So we've got to think about it in every way. We can't look at a local view and say, shut down this polluting plant. We need to shut down lots of plants and we need to address the problem. Think about it. A third of it more or less is from generating facilities, coal-fired power plants. We're seeing more and more though that will come from um, oil sands that are being lined up in Alberta and some of the flaring off of natural gas, a third from, from transportation, and about a third from real estate, more or less. There are miscellaneous other things. So how do you go after the big hits where you could have a major impact? At Ceres, when we talk about integrating sustainability into capital markets, we haven't cornered the perfect solutions. But with companies, we try and do a number of things. One is set standards of best practice. In the 90s, we came up with this thing called the Global Reporting Initiative that mandated or that called for voluntary reporting of sustainability metrics on the part of companies. I mean, everybody said, you're never going to get companies to do it. They're not going to do a comprehensive report. And 4,600 multinational companies now use GRI. It's a standard of best practice for reporting on sustainability. Is it perfect? No. Is it evolving? Yes. Um, but we now, and do all companies are they perfectly comparable? Is the reporting perfect? No. But transparency is important and disclosure is important. And 4,600 companies is better than no companies. And we still have a lot of work to do on transparency. I believe the future is in integrated reporting, where we're going to see financial reports and sustainability reports merge into one. I mean, the largest growing 
program at every one of the big accounting firms is their sustainability program. We are putting numbers to these things. These are not off-balance sheet risks, as I said, but they're on-balance sheet risks. So part of what we do is set standards of best practice. Part of what we do is work with about 80 companies who are formal series companies, and we work with dozens of others, uh, and push them in a friendly way, in a partnership way, to do a number of things. What we see as best practice starts with transparency and disclosure, because what gets measured does get managed better. If you know what your footprint is, you can set some goals for addressing it. Um, but I would argue in the year 2013, unlike when we started with GRI in the mid-90s, that's merely the start. Good reporting is important. Businesses understand numbers, understand looking, at, can build a plan of how to remedy a problem when they look at what the problem is. And, and that's not just for businesses, that's for all of us. So what should companies be doing? What is best practice you know, at this point? I mean, I'd argue it's a lot of things. One is it is taking the environment and climate change out of the ghetto of a little environmental special department. Uh, it has to be integrated into the core work of the business. We see these issues, given the magnitude, the implications of risk as governance issues, meaning they gotta be dealt with at the governance level, at the board level, board committees looking at sustainability. We see goals that need to be set at the executive level. And frankly, at more and more companies, compensation tied to sustainability metrics as compensation is tied to other important material issues within a firm. So integrating sustainability into strategic planning, into enterprise risk management, because the risks are great. Having board committees look at the goals of the company, having CEO's compensation tied to it, moving that all the way through the workforce and Intel, every single employee at the company has a compensation goal tied to climate change. Every single employee. Now, different companies do it differently, but setting goals and putting into place a system for meeting those goals is key. And that's goals that relate to products, that relate to relate to facilities and that relate to supply chain. Who has more power over the, I'm making these numbers up, Mark will tell this story far better than me, he's built it, but 5,000 suppliers who all want to make Staples happy, they want them to buy their envelopes, their paper, their pens, their, who has more leverage with them, not advocates, but the leadership of Staples to say not only do we have goals, for sustainability, we want you, our supply chain, to have gold. That's how you get depth and breadth, move it all the way through to the supply chain. And I will tell you, for the companies that are acting, they're seeing savings, they're seeing benefits with their employee base, they're seeing benefits with their uh, recruiting, and they're starting, not enough, to see some benefits with consumers. I would argue, as a community, consumers haven't acted quite with the depth or breadth that we expect. But moving companies is a big part of what we do and we work with hundreds of companies on what we call the 21st Century Roadmap, the series roadmap for best practices on sustainability. We also work, I'm gonna now really talk fast, I just got the five minute sign, uh, with investors. You heard uh, the introduction and it sounds bizarre. You know, we're managing, we're not managing the money, we're working with an investor network on climate risk. It's some of the largest shareholders in the world, CalPERS, CalSTRS, the largest public pension funds. The chair of my board <coughs> is CalPERS, a $240 billion pension fund. And Tom DiNapoli, the controller of New York State, is on my board, and he's the second largest at $200 billion. They own every company in the marketplace. That's what's in their portfolios. So part of our leverage is to go to McDonald's, or I'm not picking them out, for bad or good, and say, you ought to do something on sustainability, but it's not a $9 million advocacy organization, it's a $9 million advocacy organization and our $10 trillion worth of investors who also see a reason for integrating sustainability into the core work that the companies do. Now, none of this is pure or consistent. Our investors are looking for quick returns, just like anyone else, so they're not changing their portfolios enough Immediately, they are putting more money into green technology, not quickly enough. Companies are complicated beasts, and I don't say beasts in a negative way. They do good things, and then many of them are supportive of trade associations that make the policy arguments tougher. But they're great 
partners for making change. So we work with companies and with investors, with the investors to change how they work with companies in their portfolio. Some of them file shareholder resolutions when they get really aggravated with companies, but also trying to get the, company, the investors to put more money into green investments, and we define it uh, in complicated ways. Finally, I want to talk about capital market levers and policy, and I think I have about like, five seconds to do that. It's not just the companies and the <coughs> investors. It's got to be those things that regulate them. So we were able to get the SEC to mandate the disclosure of climate risk in 10Ks in the formal reports that companies file and investors read. Um, not because it was trendy or cool, but because it's a material risk. It rises to that level of important big deal risk, otherwise known in SEC talk in the investor world, is a material risk. If it's material, investors ought to know before they invest in a company that there's a big risk. And then they can figure out if they want to invest in staples or not. But it's important information. So making sure capital market levers, the SEC move, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners we're working with to mandate the disclosure of climate risk from insurance companies. They are regulated on the state level. We've been able to get California, New York, and Washington State to mandate that. Brings in 92% of the insurance company population because it's who's doing business in the state, not who's domiciled there. So that's been helpful. The rating agencies. How are they integrating climate and water risk and other sustainability risks? Um, we're making good progress. I think Fitch and Standard and Poor's will come out with new standards on how they're integrating water risk and climate risk into their analysis, and that's a good thing. We're working with um, NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange to require sustainability metrics for listed companies. It has to be part of the whole capital markets framework so companies aren't getting mixed signals, which is do the right thing, but we're not going to give you credit for it as your investor or as your raters. Let me say a final point, because a lot can be done with capital markets, but in the end, we need policy signals. We need to put a price on carbon, and we need to put a cap on carbon. And anyone who thinks this can all be done voluntarily is not being realistic. There are great companies who will lead, and they always have, and they will continue to. I don't have any doubt about it, and my colleagues here are perfect examples of that. But we need a level playing field. We need a standard rule by which everybody has to live. It shouldn't be that we expect Staples to do great stuff because they have a history, or, smart, or Mark Buckley's there. But other companies in their sector don't want to spend the money to integrate sustainability. That's not a model that works. We have to have state policy. We have to have federal policy and we have to have international policy. Massachusetts is pretty good with Reggie and other climate policy changes that were made. I think we're as in good shape as any state. But you can't have, st this is a federal issue and an international issue. We dodged it. The Congress didn't act over the last two years. Frankly, I don't expect them to act over the next two years. But over four or five years, we will need a price on carbon and a cap on carbon, and we need to be building momentum, and frankly, in my judgment, from capital market players starting yesterday. Build on what the president said, build on what we experienced, build on Hurricane Sandy. We need to change policy. And the reality is, we need to change it internationally as well. Because if we had the best policy in the United States of America, if China continues to grow at the rate they're growing, if they continue to import the coal that they're importing from all over the world, if they continue to import the oil sands energy coming out of, out of Alberta where we're building pipelines across the world, we will not solve this problem. It will be game over. Um, the problem is enormous, but we have no choice but to act. It is more complicated. I can get my head around how to change Washington. Maybe I haven't succeeded, nor has anyone, but at least we can imagine how to do that. Then how do you start making sure the right things are happening in Japan, in India, in China, uh, at, at a time when their population is rising. We're a world of almost 8 billion going to 9 billion. Many of those new people coming onto this earth will be moving into a slightly higher class. So rather than living in a village, they'll have a car. They'll have a, a washing machine and a Xerox machine, the things that use energy. We've got to move on renewable energy. We've got to move on a new um, 
energy system and an energy mix that too is will come out of the private sector. It will create jobs, but we need the right policy incentives. So uh, I don't mean to make it sound like it's not doable. I actually go to work every day full of excitement, full of positive attitude that these 70 hours a week are worthwhile. I think we have no choice but to act. I think we know what we have to do. Um, my parting words are let's get on with it and make it happen. And thank you all for listening to me. Thank you.